Uh, so welcome everyone. The speaker today is Chad Giusti, uh, and he's going. Uh, the title of his talk is "An Approach to Assigning Semantics to Persistent Homology Classes." Um, so, hi everyone. Um, good to see so many of you, or you know, your names in small boxes. Um, it is, uh, you know, as has been. It's a uh, weird being remote like this, but uh, it's great to have a chance to sort of connect so i really appreciate the invitation to to talk to you all and um i do really want to emphasize that if you have questions please stop me like um, i'm going to try to keep things understandable but um as we all know that's sometimes not what the, the meaning of that word changes so um okay so i want to you know start with a little bit of sort of non-mathematical or semi-mathematical meta discussion uh, but before I do, um, I do want to call out uh, a bunch of people whose work uh, makes this work possible. Uh, so um, the co-authors on this particular paper are uh, Rob Christ and Iris Yoon, and Iris uh, is a postdoc who is now at Oxford, who is absolutely fantastic. Um, if you're looking to hire somebody, <laughs> please hire Iris. She is so unbelievably good. I know people said about their postdocs, but I really, really mean it. Um, Let's see, um, Greg, Hyben, and Lori uh, are working with me on a software project that um, underlies the, uh, the sort of computation side of what we're going to do. Spencer uh, provide, is a, a lab neuroscientist uh, who provided a lot of data that we use, um, although I won't talk about it much in this talk. And Nico is my current postdoc who is working on implementing uh, sort of uh, stuff that Iris did in a, in a much broader sense. So. A lot of people who did a lot of work to make this happen. Um, and I should also, of course, thank uh, my sponsors, uh, Air Force Office of Scientific Research and the NSF both paid for most of the work that got done here. Really appreciate that. So, okay. So, but I have this kind of fuzzy, non-mathematical sounding title. So let's start with asking the following question. What do I mean when I say semantics? Um, so when I'm talking to people, um, as many of you probably know, I work in, you know, my primary application domain is neuroscience. So I tend to talk to neuroscientists and they have these very, very big questions about a very, very complicated object, right? The brain and how does it compute? and How does it store information, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and, you know, the way that they want to answer their questions, right, is they go to the lab and they record activity in the brain. So they, you know, this is a picture of a spike train. If you haven't seen one before, each row there is an individual neuron, and those are binary on-off events for the neurons. It's about a millisecond per spike. So that's a very, very short time window there. A very small number of neurons for an average experiment, but you know, it's just sort of an idea of what the data they're gonna come up with is gonna look like, that one one form. Uh, they bring that to me and I look at it and I say, oh my gosh, I have no idea how we're ever gonna think about that data like that. So we're gonna summarize it in a nicer way. <laughs> Um, so I, you know, I talk them down from their, I've got a, a you know, million by a million uh, binary matrix and we, we end up with nice symmetric matrix, which is, you know, also a million by a million, but only half as many entries. Um, so, so you end up with, um, you know, some notion of, of similarity between activity and elements in the system. Okay. And this is usually the 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 language that I'm capable of speaking and this is is I want to think about the elements the neurons in the brain and I want to think about constructing some sort of topological object which encodes something about the similarity and activity and use that to uncover structure in the system and so the conversations I have with neuroscientists are largely how do we take your big question and map it into you know find questions that are appropriate of course and then map them into data like this, which I can then construct some social complexes out of, right? This is just the data of your standard via Torres Schrift complex or clique complex. <clears throat> so I use my filter simplicial complexes, right? And then I can do persistence modules because that's my favorite tool, right? It's supposed to look for sort of non-local structure uh, and I summarize it in the barcode. So, right, I, I play this, this sort of very, um, you know, uh, intricate game to go from the brain to some list of things. And, and then the question, the question I always get once we get to this point, and which is, as far as I know, the hardest question anybody's ever asked me is, you know, okay, so you've got this, this barcode down here. Um, how do I interpret it back there? <laughs> what does that mean? 
what is that bar? What did you do, right? Why did you do all of this hard work? Um, so in an ideal world, what I would have done is sat down and thought really, really hard at this stage, at the combinatorial encoding stage. And I would have said to myself, how do I build a simplistic complex whose cycles represent answers to the question the neuroscientist has? That would be great. However, I am rarely intelligent enough to solve that problem. I think if I could solve that problem, I probably would already understand the question well enough to, uh, to, 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 to come up with the answer, or at least gonna be a whole lot closer than I am. I, I don't have the domain knowledge, but I also just, this is a very, very hard problem, right? How do you, how do you construct a simplicial complex whose cycles have a fixed meaning? Um, so I'm unlikely to end up in that situation. More likely, and, and this is very common for a lot of people, right? What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take an off the shelf construction, the cleat complex of my symmetric matrix, I'm gonna compute these uh, compute these bars, compute the persistence diagram or the persistence module. And then I'm going to uh, try to interpret the output, okay? And in machine learning, people have gotten quite a lot of uh, traction on this, right? Because essentially what you say is I'd like to, um, you know, I can use these topological invariants as invariants. I can say, if this is substantially different than this, then these two things are probably substantially different, right? And that, that worked, that's worked out very well. Um, but it gets really hard to answer scientific questions if that's the only tool in your toolbox. So what I wanna do is construct methods for answering the question, what does this cycle mean? Um, and I'm not gonna claim that I've solved this problem. Uh, I'm going to give you one approach that we built that works pretty well. Um, so uh, before I get going, one thing I do wanna say is that the persistence module and the barcode are different, right? The barcode characterizes the persistence module up to isomorphism. I'm gonna be working at the algebraic level with the persistence module. However, it gets extremely cumbersome when you try to say, you know, element interval element of the interval decomposition of the persistence module over and over and over and over again. So what I want to do is I'm gonna say bar, but I want you to think about me having a fixed interval decomposition of the barcode. So it's not an up to isomorphism class. Whenever I'm talking about a bar, I'm actually talking about a sequence of vectors in a, a sequence of vector spaces, all right? And if that gets confusing, or if you, you know, if you lose track of that, please stop me and let me know. Um, it, it, it's just, it's, it's the technical thing that I want to sweep under the rug. There's a lot of, if, you know, I'll show you the paper at the end and you can go read about how to actually do it. Okay. So at the end of the day, what I really want is something like this. I want, so I am, I speak topology, which is like, you know, speaking in standard measurements. And I need a way to translate into the brain, which might be, you know, I could think about things happening in the brain or measured in the brain in terms of, of uh, metric, right? And so it's much more sensible language to speak probably. But unfortunately, I don't know how to get from one to the other without having some sort of translation device, right? A simple translation device. I know how to measure cycles. I would like to know information about biological questions in the brain or whatever your application domain happens to be. Um, so, so this is the device that I want to build, but I want to build it for persistent homology. Okay, so if I go and ask algebraic topologists, of which I occasionally think to be one, if nobody's looking, uh, Right, they would say, well, what you should do is you should compare the cycles that you have to a space that you understand. Right, this is how we understand cycles in algebraic topology. So I have this, I have this um, simplicial complex. I compute its homology. Great, it's two-dimensional. H one is two-dimensional. I'm going to build a reference space, a space that I know everything about. So here's a model of the circle, right? That that is uh, interesting. You know, that it contains information that's interesting to me for some reason. And then what I need to do is build a map from my reference into my actual space. And then I can look at the induced map on homology and take the generator of my homology in one place to my generator in the other place. And now I know, you know, inside this two dimensional vector space on the right, which thing corresponds to my thing of interest. So if I had a function, then I could just use induced maps on homology. My life would be great. I would, you know, follow my nose and, and everything would be good. And of course there's a lot of details here, but you know, Solve problem, don't worry about it. 
Um, so why is that hard in practice? So let's say I have just a simple experiment. I'm going to take a video recording of a mouse in a maze. So I've got my mouse and it's wandering around. And, and then, you know, of course, the actual mazes are right circles. They're usually, you know, square, but whatever. It's the apology. Um, right. So I've got my mouse it's going to wander around in this maze. And I look at that and I say, wow, there's a, there's a circle there. This is going to be great. I'm going to find the topology. Um, Neuroscience is going to record these spikes going on in the rat's brain again, right, as it goes around in the thing. So this is my input data on both sides. And what I'd like to do is take the semantics of what's upstairs downstairs, right? I'd like to, right, I'd like to build a map. Um, so I compute these barcodes, and this is a toy example, but it's not exactly wrong. That, you know, these, these are not the actual barcodes from these actual things. These are, this is a cartoon. Um, but what I might notice very easily, and this would happen in the video that I would take, is that I would get two long, uh, two longish bars, right, uh, in, in uh, the first dimension. And the reason that would happen is because there are going to be two major features to this video, likely. There's going to be the rat walking around the track. There's also going to be the rat turning inside the track. And that's going to happen a lot. And so the rat can turn 360 degrees. So the direction the rat is facing is a cyclic feature in the video. And that'll happen pretty regularly. And so if with the right choice of, of metric, I'll get the, you know, I'll get two circles. And, and this is, in fact, the, the, the coordinate space that I might pick up here, if everything else is, is fixed, is probably going to be a torus. Cool. That's great. I still feel really good about my ability to think about tori because I spent a lot of years studying algebraic topology, and I, it's one of the first things that I learned, and I feel like I know it pretty well. Downstairs, in my neurons, let's say I see just one long bar. Well, you know, I could go to the neuroscientist and say, what are the circular things that the rat will be encoding? And they'll say, well, there are position recording cells. So those definitely would record the rat going around the circle. There are head direction cells, which will tell you what direction the rat was facing. So maybe that's what we're seeing, right? There's a circle there. But as the rat goes around the circle, it's gonna turn, right? The tangent vector of the rat is going to turn as it goes around the circle. Uh, so, Maybe the most natural thing to expect to see as a significant feature in the rat's brain is the sum of those two classes, right? It's going to go around in a circle physically, but it's also going to turn in a circle as it does so. So maybe that's what that bar is. Or maybe I'm recording from an area that only has place cells or only has head direction cells, or maybe it's none of those. Maybe it's just some other circular coordinate that has nothing to do with any of that stuff. And that's really the, the issue um, at the end of the day is that there's stuff going on in the video that has nothing to do with the rat, and there's stuff going on in the brain that has nothing to do with the thing I'm recording in the video. So expecting a function in either direction is a big ask, right? I, the inputs to the system are not necessarily going to determine the state, and the state of the system is not necessarily determined by the inputs that I know about or care about. So, so any complex that I build based on the information I'm expecting to see may or may not be have have any notion of a function in either direction, which makes it really difficult for me to construct uh, a, an induced map. Um, so, what can I expect to be able to do? Right? How might I get around this problem? And so, what I'm going to do really quickly, I'm going to simplify this problem because rats and brains and all of that stuff have nothing to do with what's going to happen next. So, I'm going to I'm going to simplify us down to a simpler problem. So, here's a torus, and I've, I've made my very stylized little arrows there because I don't know, I felt like I wanted to make it pretty. And I've sampled a bunch of points on the torus, right? And so, I should think about these. If you want to keep the previous example in mind, these are the frames in the video that I've sampled. Um, and of course, they'd be biased here. I've sampled them nicely because I want the answer to come out a little nicely. Um, and I can compute the barcode, and it's going to be the barcode that we saw before. Right. And this is just the barcode of the Viator Strips complex. And then there's going to be this sort of one dimensional subspace. And, and here I've actually put them down as points on this torus, right? Because I want to simplify the problem. So we're going to get rid of all the brain stuff. I'm just going to sample along some path on the torus, right? Um, and I'll compute the barcode of that thing. And what I want to know 
right? I can look at the picture on the left. I know the answer now. I look at the picture on the left and I say, ah, which cycle in the torus is that, uh, is that long bar in the bottom diagram corresponding to? Well, I don't know which of those two bars upstairs it is, but it's definitely the horizontal, um, right? The horizontal generator of the torus. So that's what I want to, that's what I want to extract, right? That's the information I would like to get, but I don't have a function because the sample points in Q are not points in P. They're just some points I sampled along, along a uh, distribution. So I need some way to get into this. And the one thing I could do, the reasonable thing to do, and this goes back to like, I think one of the very first papers on um, applied topology is that I could sample cross distance, right? I could say, well, you know, I have points in P and points in Q and they, they, they happen to exist in a joint metric space in this case. So I can construct a cross dissimilarity matrix, a dissimilarity matrix for points in P versus points in Q. Um, if you, they didn't happen to be in the same place, if, right? So neurons in the brain and frames in a video, I would have to come up with some way to reference to compute, but I could use time, for example, as sort of a, 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 a lever to get myself in and compute something like this. Or if you're in two different brain regions computing neurons, or if you're, I don't know, any number of things, right? You have to come up with a measure of cross dissimilarity, but, but cross correlation, cross correlograms are very common thing in time series analysis. So you can always come up with something. So let's assume this is the data I have. It's very common to be able to get it. Um, and what I want to do is I want to take this information and turn it into a way to map between these two barcodes, these two persistence modules. So, um, all right. So, and I just want to very quickly say, right, that there is a construction already in place. And, and this is I'm, I'm cheating just a little bit. I'll put an asterisk on this, right? The witness complex at scale T is I'm just going to take this matrix. I'm going to threshold it. I'm going to take the rows, the elements of P to be vertices and the columns to be uh, uh, simplices. And I'm going to basically take, right? So I'll take everything which is, has, is below some, all the entries are below some threshold, make this a binary matrix. I'm going to call this the witness complex. Um, and it's just going to tell you, ah, these elements of P are similar enough to some element in Q. Okay. Um, and then I'm going to take downward closure to get a simplicial complex. Um, right. As it's written, it's a hypergraph, but we, we can fix that. Um, so, okay. So um, why did I say um, I'm lying a little bit? If you go back and you look at the original witness complexes, and in, in, uh, I think Ben De Silva's paper was probably the first time that, that was written down. Uh, there's a uh, there's a scaling factor that I'm erasing here um, because he was trying to use it to simplify point cloud computations. But I claim it should be possible for a point in Q to be really bad at seeing points in P. Um, so I'm not going to introduce that scaling factor. I'm going to call this witness complex, even though it's slightly different usage of the term. It's just a scale. Um, so okay, so I, I have points in Q witnessing points in P that is being similar enough to them to create simplices um, and at different rights. So the idea being that, you know, I'm going to take a point um, in Q up here and I'm going to look at all the things that are similar enough to it. And if any, any points in there are going to form a simplex. And then I'm going to let that scale vary because I'm an applied topologist and I like to let scales vary on simple complexes. Okay, cool. Um, so I want to now pause. Um, and tell you in a simplified example about a really important theorem and why this is going to, <laughs> that's going to let us use this. So here's a very, very simple version of the same thing. So here's a, you know, points in P and points in Q and I've already thresholded. So this is a very small matrix. I'm going to construct this witness complex using this matrix. Okay, so here we go. Um, so points in P are vertices, points in Q are maximal simplicity or just simplicities, but you know, maximal in this case, right? So I've labeled everything in sight. Um, great, I build a simplicial complex, but the one thing that, you know, one might naturally ask at this stage when one is building this is you measured cross dissimilarity from P to Q, but why didn't you measure it from Q to P, right? What was the choice? Why was there a choice there, right? And, and many of you already know the answer to this question, but it's really worth pointing out that if I transpose this thing, right, and measure from Q to P, like Q be my vertices and P my simplices, I get a witness complex. Everything is great. That should say DQP there. That's a typo. Um, okay. Um, but 
But it turns out, right, those are both models for S1. They both have one, one cycle, and that's not a coincidence. Um, so if I take the barycentric subdivision of each one of these complexes, what does that mean? It means take every simplex in the complex and turn it into a vertex, right? And then wire them up as needs be. Oh, but my simplices are indexed by elements of the other complex. In particular, hiding inside that barycentric subdivision is a copy of the other witness complexes barycentric subdivision. Um, and then you just apply some contractibility and you see that these two things are in fact homotopy equivalent. So um, this is a result known as Dowker's theorem and I'm gonna state the one that I care about which is the persistent homology version which says that if I transpose the matrix it doesn't change my persistent homology which tells me that I have a clever way of taking a complex whose vertices are P and turning it into a complex whose vertices are Q using exactly the information of a dissimilarity measure. So if you give me, right, so you've given me these two distinct vertex sets on which you've built your favorite complexes, which represent your two systems. And I can take the vertex set for this one and the vertex set for this one, and I can translate cycles back and forth. Great. So this is fantastic, right? And this is Dowker's theorem from Dowker's um, homology groups of a relation. This is exactly using the fact that what we have is some sort of nested sequence of relations between the elements in one system and the elements in the other system encoded in the dissimilarity measure. Okay. So back to our example, right? I can compute the witness barcode. Doesn't matter which way I twist this thing. So I can do whatever's most computationally efficient. I see that there's a bar there and I say, okay, I've got, you know, an element in the barcode, um, we'll call it tau. Uh, and what I can do is I can apply Dowker's theorem, Dowker, not Downer, uh, sorry. <laughs> the sad, sad theorem. Dowker's theorem to uh, translate, and, and right, and it's constructive. I, the, the fact that I can use this barycentric subdivision construction means that I can compute the answer locally using the barycentric subdivision. So I can actually take one of these things and one of these two and turn it into the other one. Um, and I can write, I can write down an algorithm for doing it. So I can bounce back and forth. Okay, cool. But Chad, you say, this is not what you set out to do. What you set out to do was take an element in the Cleek complex for that first point cloud and give me back an element in the Cleek complex or the very short complex in the second point cloud. And here, not, I don't see any Viator strips complexes anywhere. So what I have to do now is translate from the Viator strips complex to the, to the witness complex in both places, right? I've got to do that in sort of a sensible way. So new problem, two filtered complexes, one set of vertices, right? I'm gonna take a vertex set P and build a torch complex. I'm gonna take vertex set P and build a witness complex and I need to make the two talk. So um, I'm just gonna take a very simple example and try to talk you through. So at this point, I, I'm, not gonna, I'm not gonna lie, things get a little technical. I'm going to avoid the technicalities as much as possible. And again, I'm gonna point you at the paper, but I just kind of want to talk you through the idea of what you have to do to make this work. So here's a simple, here's a simple filtered simplicial complex sitting on one set of vertices, okay? And as you can see, we start out with no cycle and then a cycle appears. And so I can compute the barcode, right? It's born, there's one cycle and it's born and then it, it fills up and it dies. Uh, let me start with the same, or let's see. So let me um, so let me let me study that cycle, right? I'm interested in that cycle because it's the one that's there. Uh, so what I want to do is is get a hold of it, and I want want to think about it in sort of the sense of asking what makes up this cycle. What what should I be thinking about when I say ah tau, right? So I look at my picture, and I say, well, you know, tau is an equivalence class. Of, um, of elements in the chain group, right? It's just, and if I'm thinking over F2, it's just subsets uh, of, of the set of edges um, up to deformation. So I could look in any one of those complexes along the lifetime of tau and find things that I could reasonably call tau. But the farther down the life I go, the more stuff I've added in. So the bigger the equivalence class. So it's reasonable if I don't have any other information and I'm looking to figure out what should tau be, it's very reasonable for me to go as far as possible without killing tau, right? So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna stop at the last 
place tau is alive, right? And if this were not a uh, discrete barcode, I wouldn't be able to say this, but fortunately everything inside is a you know, discrete set of simplices. So there's a, there's a stopping point there. Okay, I'm gonna look in that complex and I'm gonna see that there are three things that I could reasonably say, this is tau, right? Um, uh, each one of them is, uh, and then they're equivalent under the normal homology equivalence relation, right? So those are my representatives, my cycle representatives. Um, and so if I were going to find tau in another simplicial complex on the same filtration, right? If I wanna translate this cycle to a different complex on the same set of vertices, any one of these things is a candidate for something that should be called tau in the other complex, right? They're all things that I could reasonably claim that was the thing. Uh, and since I'm building a general method, I want to be as permissive as possible. And in no circumstances do I want, right? If I'd started way at the left, said only the giant cycle is tau, then later I could, you know, I might miss something. So I'm going to be as permissive as possible. This is a choice. Um, you, it might be the wrong choice for your particular application, but I don't have any information. So, so this is a point where you have to turn a knob sometimes. Okay, so I've got my notion of tau. And now I'm going to put another simplicial complex on the same set of vertices. Let's call it that one. Right. So here's another filtration on the same set of vertices. And I, oh, that's bad luck. Because if I go out to omega and just try to map those things across, I'm going to be in trouble, right? Because um, that bottom thing has filled in, right? So I can't compare directly at omega, even though it's pretty clear to me way back at the beginning, right? At the first place that they're born, that's, that's the same cycle. So that thing, there should be a copy of tau downstairs, but if I try to map it over just by looking in, in filtration omega, um, it's not gonna work, uh, right? I'll, I'll hit zero. So it has the same barcode, right? But, but omega is the wrong place to consider, even though that's the place where I wanna think about tau living. So, so what I have to do is, is find a way to take these representatives and, and map them down there, um, right? I wanna find anything in any, anywhere in T um, that intersects the, this list of, of possible representatives, right? I wanna find classes downstairs whose representatives contain those things upstairs. That's gonna be my, my criteria for what it means to be the same. And I shouldn't do it at a fixed parameter downstairs because I might end up with the wrong answer. Right, it looks like they're, they're just disjoint cycles there. Okay, fair enough. So um, here's the trick. Um, the trick is that I'm gonna introduce a new filtration. Um, and the new filtration is gonna look, right? So, so what is the information I'm interested in? I'm interested in the complete equivalence class of all the things that are in cycle tau at parameter omega in the first, uh, right, the first filtration. I, I wanna look here. Um, and then I wanna find things on the right that fit there. So I'm only interested in things that are in there. So I'm just gonna intersect, uh, right? I'm gonna intersect the entire second complex with that filtration level to create a new auxiliary filtration, right? So, so now I get two connected components in the first filtration and then I get, oh, there's my cycle and it's just kind of hanging out. And then on the right, things start to fill in because um, right, that last thing is uh, this guy intersect that guy. So, Right, so there's a new filtration. And the thing that I wanna note about this new filtration, right, is that it has an infinite bar. Um, and the infinite bar exists because I can't possibly fill in the cycle tau. It can't be done because it exists everywhere in the filtration, um, right? And I'm intersecting stuff with it. It happens to be the case that the second filtration ends up being contractible like it does in Beatrice Schrips complexes and most other data things that we do, then infinite bars are going to correspond to homology classes at filtration omega in sigma one in the first simplicial complex. So any long bar, any infinite bar here is going to be um, a homology class, uh, right, that's present at my target filtration. And one of those bars, or maybe some combination of those bars, is going to be the thing that I'm, right, the thing that I'm looking for. Okay. So now I have this nice intersection of uh, this nice intersection of complexes, and what I can do is I can write down linear. I can write down an actual linear equation, right? I can say, okay, I have a map from this intersection of complexes into sigma two. 
So that's a nice map and I can induce a map on homology. So I'm gonna enumerate elements in the, um, right, in the complex I'm interested in, in sigma two, uh, that are hit by the long bar in various filtrations. And like I said, this is the part where I'm gonna sweep details under the under the um, this the way you do this is setting up a system of linear equations and then you have to check that certain generators exist in certain places and and it gets very very messy um, in the sense that there are a lot of not too complicated but there are a lot of details um, but this is linear algebra uh, it's just solving systems of linear equations many of them so um, if you want to see the details link to the paper at the end if you want to do this link to code at the end okay so. Great, so we're almost there because now I have a tool for taking two filtrations, right? On the same set of vertices, taking a cycle in one of them and figuring out what things in the other one could correspond to it. By which I mean, which persistent homology classes in the other filtration contain representatives which are included in the homology class I'm interested in at the last possible filtration. That is to say, it's the most permissive way you can interpret the question. Okay, so let's glue it together. So remember, this is my question, right? I have, I have my torus, I got my barcode, I got my cycle, I got my barcode. And over there on the right, uh, I've computed the witness barcode and it's just there for reference purposes, right? The, it doesn't matter which way I computed, it, it's the same and I'll apply diapers to them in the middle. So here we go. Uh, right, I'm gonna choose my favorite class tau uh, down here in Q and I'm gonna ask who it was up in the torus. So I'm going to use my, right? So I'm going to use this extension um, I described to take tau and give me all possible elements in the persistence module for the witness barcode or for the witness complex supported on Q uh, by moving through this auxiliary filtration. Okay, then I'm gonna apply Dowker's theorem that's going to swap me over onto vertices P. Uh, and then last, I'm going to um, extend again from these elements off into uh, that top barcode. And what I've drawn there is one collection of, you know, one answer uh, and it a cycle representative from the appropriate class. Okay, so I've done... I've made as few choices as possible. And one thing I should definitely stop and wave my hands about at this point and say is there are, there's not one answer, right? Each one of those black arrows there, the extensions give me a multi-set, uh, or not a multi-set, right? A, um, is, is a, uh, it gives me a set of, of possible uh, extensions, right? A set of possible representations in the other barcode, all the classes it could possibly be. And so you multiply those, you know, the computations together uh, to get all these things, you have to be a little bit careful about not letting this get out of control. And you can do things like filter out short bars or whatever you want to do. Uh, if you're just looking for a rough answer, if you want to be theoretically completely robust and justified, you have to do the whole thing. Fortunately, it turns out that these are solutions of relatively small linear systems. Um, so depending on how your barcode looks, and, and you only have to solve certain linear systems based on the structure of the barcodes on both sides. So, so there are a lot of ways to reduce this and, and make it more tractable. But for a large system, blindly doing this is gonna be very hard. Um, but if you're interested in figuring out more, uh, I, we would love to know how you do it more efficiently, computer scientists. Um, okay, so anyway, so it looks like, right? So the cycle representative on the left, right? Supported on the points P, looks like something that represents the thing Q which is good. That's what I hope it looks like. And um, this is representative. No matter how many different ways you play this game, uh, right? Cho making choices on this thing, you're gonna get something which is a deformation of something that looks like that. So, so these are in fact uh, exactly the things and we'll give you a complete list. Uh, so the list here would be extremely long because there are many, many, many representatives and many, many, many classes in that persistent homology, but, but they're there. You get them, you get a list, you can, uh, you can explore them to your heart's content. Okay, so I'm a few minutes early. Uh, so I'm um, happy to answer more questions or not, but basically um, I refer to these as analogous bars because they are, um, 
they're not, you know, they're not induced map bars or anything like that. They're based on some data about a relation, right? So this is analogous to that. I don't make any stronger, I don't make any stronger claims, um, right? But I can compute persistent cycles using my cross dissimilarity information. If you sample cross dissimilarity many times, you should, there's some stability theory that tells you that you get kind of the same answers. Those are theorems somebody should prove, but really appreciate it. Um, things you can do with this that people want to do, right? If I sample the torus twice, or your favorite space twice, right? I compute persistent homology. I want to know which bars, or which elements in persistent homology are the same, right? That's useful information. Um, and that's something that's hard to do because you lack the same uh, vertex set. Maybe the samples are different sizes, who knows? Um, so this, this is a tool that does that. Um, it lets you, if I have a sequence of diagrams, like I have a time series of diagrams, and I want to know what, where's my cycle moving around inside the, the data, you can do that, right? If I do clustering or dimensionality reduction, then that's all good too. Um, so, so these are just, you know, and we talked about all these examples in the paper and, and, and several others. So um, where can I find my details in my code? Well, the paper uh, is persistent in extensions and analog bars um, written again with Iris Yoon and uh, Rob Greist, uh, papers on the archive and hopefully someday will appear in print uh, and code uh, written heroically by Iris, uh, it would not have been possible without Greg uh, Henselman Patricic's um, Irene software library, which let us get into the linear algebra really in depth. Um, uh, ideally, there will be a new version in the next six to eight months, which uses the exact library that uh, Greg, Lori, Hyben, and I mostly, uh, Greg and Hyben on the code side have been uh, uh, pushing forward, um, which will be much more transparent, much more efficient, but, but, uh, but you can do it now on your data using this code. So anyway, uh, that's where I want to wrap up and happy to take any questions. So before we take questions, um, a round of applause for our speaker. And, uh, <laughs> questions. Uh, feel free to unmute yourself or type the question uh, into the chat window. I have a stupid question. I don't know if I should go first, but just very quick question. You, you mentioned solving a system of linear equations without knowing much. Why is it restricted to a system of linear equations? Why not nonlinear equations? I'm just uh, asking. Sure, no, that's a, it's a wonderful question. So um, the big deep dark secret of applied topology is that because we work over a field, literally everything is a system of linear equations. Uh, so right, all of our boundary maps and our complexes and all of our induced maps and everything else those are all just secretly matrices over some field so at the end of the day um right when i want to do um when i want to do these extensions i'm asking what things are in the image of some cycle under some map um and so i just have to write down the appropriate um system of linear equations on the chain complex and uh solve and at the end of the day it just turns out to, in this case it just turns out to be a computation of um uh, what you're trying to find is a um uh an affine subspace so you know it's a computation of some subspace and then an offset vector great thanks sure hey Elkanan, go for it thanks let me actually lower my hand um so Actually, this is a, the slide I wanted to ask about. So the, um, the orange curve, so in principle, you could find another representative, or there might be one that uses fewer, goes through fewer points. So if the original problem is solving some linear equations, what kind of, um, what would be the complexity of imposing something like that? What kind of, would, would it be like a linear programming problem? What would you get? So that is a fantastic question. Um, so looking for, so right, it, once you have access to all of this information, these are solvable problems. And um, uh, 
so there's actually a an, uh, a video on the YouTube channel by um, an undergrad student that worked with Lori and Greg, um, Lou Lee, who um, wrote a very nice paper about um, finding optimal cycles in some sort of very robust and sensible way using this kind of data. Not this kind of data specifically, but you know, searching for optimal generators in uh, persistent homology classes that are sort of um, optimal across the lifetime in some sense. Um, and it's, it's a very nice review about uh, the paper is in Frontiers. Um, I apologize, I don't remember exactly where. Uh, Lori is on the channel, if she's listening, maybe she can hop in and tell us what, what the journal it's in. Um, but one of the Frontiers journals um, from about six months ago, and it, um, it talks about L1 and L0 optimization. And one of the surprising things that happens there actually is that um, you get basically the same answer if you do L0, which is intractable, and L1, which is easy. Um, so you can actually get away with doing optimizations in these classes pretty pretty effectively. Very interesting. Thanks so much. Sure. And uh, Lori just posted a link, so in case uh, uh, anyone <laughs> wants to see it. OK, so now uh, we have a bunch of questions. So the next one to raise his hand was Bastian. Yeah, thank, thanks for this, for this wonderful talk. I, I have a question on uh, what to do next now. So now you can put this together and you can you can link features together. Have you also considered to to create a kind of way to to turn this into a mapping or or some kind of similarity between the spaces, even though no such thing might might exist a priori? So so could that be kind of the the linking back thing that you that you want to have? Yeah. So. Um... And that's the, the ultimate goal, right? At the end of the day is to say, I want to take, you know, so if it were a correspondence and not a relation, you'd be in a better place, right? And in some sense, what you can do with this is use this because then you, you're sort of more in the, the world where you prove things like um, gromov hausdorff distance stability mm -hmm. and things like that, right? So, so I think what I would like to be able to do is say, ah, these elements in this system, right? So, so you could do this and get nothing upstairs, right? It could be the thing, right? If I had chosen a cycle downstairs that was not an essential cycle, it would have mapped to no bars upstairs or to short bars only or something. So in some sense, you, um, you, can, you can use this to say, ah, these topological features in this space correspond in a sensible way to topological features in that space under my observations of the similarities of the systems. Mm -hmm. So let me now try to construct a dictionary. And that's, that's, the, that's the hope, right? Um, so we're applying this in the study. So, so the, the problem that we're currently working on um, and Iris is currently um, writing a paper about is, is basically we took activity in different neural systems uh, that we knew were sort of driven by the same behavioral stimulus, but were not necessarily in any way directly connected. Mm -hmm. um, and we determine, you know, we use that to determine that the circular coordinate, one of the circular coordinates in this neural system and one of the circular coordinates in this neural system are morally the same. So it gives us a dictionary in terms of the neural activity at the level of organization, not at the level of individual neurons. And that's that's exactly what we want to be able to do. So um, I'm happy to say that in one example, we've successfully done this once. <laughs> but, <laughs> okay. uh, but a general theory, general tools for doing this, and other methods, right? I don't want to say, like I said at the beginning, this is one method that seems to do pretty good. Um, I think I think I would love it if people spent more time and energy, uh, you know, not not uh, just doing better than I did, and uh, and also figuring out what this all means. <laughs> <laughs> Very nice. Thank thank you. Really appreciate it. Um, okay. Uh, so then the next question, um, so the next person to raise um, his hand is Yuan. Uh, do you want to unmute yourself and go ahead? Thank you. Thanks for your, uh, for your talk. So I was, ask, I was trying to ask uh, the application in the final page about dimension reduction. Mm -hmm. So let's say I have a torus and uh, I use something uh, uh, like the dimension reduction method, like UMAP. I get a bedding in two dimensional space. I get only one size uh, circle. So how can I use this method to like, like yeah. find a correspondence? So, so what do you mean by the application? Can you give me a more explicit example? Sure. So so first, let me just let me make a simpler example. Let's say your torus is in very high dimensional space, and you use you map to move it down to say six dimensions, where you know it's that's not too bad. 
And the reason I choose those exact numbers is because if you uh, if you go find there's a beautiful paper from a few months ago uh, by uh, Ben Dunn and colleagues at NTNU where they used uh, dimensionality reduction and persistent homology to identify porous in the infrarhinal cortex. Um, this is just absolutely fundamental uh, research in neuroscience. Um, and what, and, but at the end of the day, right, they use dimensionality reduction to take the, the cells, uh, you know, the, the, the population activity, of the population cells, they pushed it down to six dimensions where they could then have a clean enough signal to pick up the top topological structure of the torus. Um, and you might ask, can we decode back in the original cell space? And this tool would let you play that game because you can take um, right, the information of the cells upstairs and then the dimensionality reduction might not preserve. Um, right, so one of the things they do is they reduce the total number of cells dramatically when they dimensionality reduce. So you get a sub object. And here you need something like persistent extension. You wouldn't have to use the full power of the Docker complex because you'd know the map between vertices and everything would be kind of okay. Um, you end up with two filtrations on the same complex and we have you know, what there's a sub tool for doing that. Um, when you were, if you destroy the topology, so if you flatten this thing out in such a way that you kill the cycle you're interested in, right? So if I push down to two dimensions, I will definitely do that for at least one of them. Um, then what you'll see is sort of how it got smooshed, right? You'll see a linear combination of small cycles that appear in the noise. And you know, I've played this game and you get a picture that looks like you know, a circle in like just if I took through a random cycle inside that box in the top left there. Um, you know, it's a, it's a linear combination of short bars. It doesn't really mean anything, but somehow it is the result of where the circle went when you smashed it. Um, I don't really know how to interpret that, but I suspect it, you know, what, what you want to say is, oh, there are no long bars left that represent this thing. I must have killed it. Um, I see. I see. Thank you. Sure. Appreciate it. Okay, and then we have uh, um, uh, Boris um, for the next question. Yeah, thanks for a great talk. Very interesting stuff. So I have a, maybe it's a speculation, but so in this picture, I have a point cloud P and point cloud Q, let's say. So, you, so let's say I am trying to measure the distances between them in a way. So you get the persistent diagrams and you look at their Wasserstein distance, one or infinity. Now you have a dual construction in the other side. With this complex you can think of, you start with the distances on the point cloud and you mm -hmm. get now persistent diagrams of them in a way. So you get a filtration. Is there any relation because we have a stability result for these persistent diagrams, global Hausdorff distance, which is the top distance in the witness complex here. Because when you get, when you get to the, the, the gromov hausdorff distance in a way, so you have some, uh, idea about this, this complex threshold here, let's say. Uh, is there any relation between the Wasserstein distance of these point clouds, P and Q, persistent diagrams of point clouds, and like persistent diagrams of the other side? This is a great question. I don't know the answer at all, but but your question did actually, so I, I'm sorry, I can't, I can say nothing intelligent about that, <laughs> except to say that um, I expect there should be some answer, positive answer. But, but one thing that your question does immediately tell me to think about, which I really appreciate it, is that, you know, one of the big problems when you're computing these distances versus diagrams is what matching should you use, right? And in some sense, this, you could, you could apply a tool like this, although, you know, this is computationally expensive in and of itself. Nonetheless, you could, you could apply the tool to, to work out if you should be matching points in the cloud, right? And, and that might, in, in some sense, give you a, a more refined notion of distance, um, which is, not something I thought about until 10 seconds ago. So <laughs> I really appreciate the, the question. And, and again, I, I'm, I, I don't wanna, I don't, I'm not gonna do virtually any of this. So uh, if anybody wants to think about these things and how to make them better and stronger and faster, I'm more than happy to, to talk to people and work with people because man, I, I think in my mind, this is one of the major bottlenecks in applied topology. And I think it's uh, any, any, anybody who's better at this than me should solve them. <laughs> okay, thank you very much for a great talk again. Thank you. Okay, uh, are there any more questions? Um, 
Okay, so if there are no more questions, then I'm gonna uh, stop the recording. Uh, so Chad, thanks again, and uh, feel free to stick around, um, uh, um, like if you want to ask questions offline. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you.